greetings, greetings, and welcome to Heal Talk, Real Talk with Lisa. It's so good to be here with you. Hope all is well. I am so excited today because uh, today I have a special guest. Actually, she is guest number one for 2021, and I would like to welcome Tina Ojarian. Hi, Tina John. Hi, Lisa John. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. So uh, it's a great day. How did you do with all the wind and everything yesterday? Oh my God, it was crazy. It was really, I mean, my kids were freaked out, but you know what? There are worse things to deal with. It's fine. The exactly. weather's been great. It's been like 80 degrees in January. You can't beat that. So true. Well, um, I'd like to do an introduction for you. And for those who have not been reading, uh, I would, uh, I'm going to introduce you. Well, I met you first online and then started following you and then got to know more about you. And we've met only, I think, in person once. But to me, it's like I've known you for a long time. Tina is a renowned traumatic brain injury litigator who specializes in complex mechanism of the brain injury, particularly those that occur in the workplace. I believe Tina is a workers' comp attorney. And you know what, Tina, I would like you to take it from here and introduce yourself in the scope of exactly what you do, because I can go around and talk about all the acclamations that you've had and all the things you've earned, especially being super attorneys uh, and lawyer. There is a difference between an attorney and a lawyer, and I know you are a lawyer. So Tina John, take it from here. Thank you so much, Lisa John, for that gracious introduction. So yeah, I specialize in traumatic brain injury litigation with an emphasis on brain injuries and catastrophic injuries that happen in the workplace. Um, you know, that could be severe traumatic brain injuries, I like the mild traumatic brain injuries as well, like the concussion type cases where you see someone and they look and seem just fine, but then the loved ones are telling you that they're not who they used to be. I do some spinal cord injury uh, litigation as well, some severe PTSD, but generally my practice is limited to catastrophic injury only, um, to really serious injuries, life-changing injuries, um, you know, and we get to come in and do the silver lining at a really difficult time in people's lives. It's stressful, but it's also really a blessing and a privilege. Um, I think there is a, a an echo in your camera or the sound system. Could oh. you? Yeah. I hear there is a, a little bit of an interruption or an echo. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is this better? Is this Much better? better. Okay. Much better. Okay. Yeah. I think the okay. volume might have been just too high. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. Uh, so it can be just about anything. And I know you're practicing in Los Angeles and you've had huge cases and I've been following some of your cases. Being from uh, a background, my background being, uh, I used to work for an attorney for nine years. I was an assistant to attorney and legal assistant. But it was different. And I've been practicing as a hypnotherapist for the last 21 years. And I got interested in what you are doing because a very good friend of mine, who's also not only a coach speaker, Keith O'Neill, he healed himself through hypnotherapy after having a, a traumatic brain injury from a, a very small fall. But, and it was not workers' comp. But the effect it had on him, he was hospitalized for over four months and they didn't think he was coming back because for a few days he even went into coma. So would you please explain what is from a small little blow to the head all the way to a massive head injury? Sure, that is a huge question. And I can take up an entire hour just I know. about mild traumatic brain injuries, let alone the moderate and the severe. The characterization, you know, mild, moderate, or severe brain injury is not talking about the symptoms. It's talking about the mechanism of injury. But the symptomology with brain injury is different in every individual. It's not standard. It depends on their comorbidities, their premorbidities, you know, their um, 
their health before the injury occurred. Uh, so, you know, it, it really depends, but a mild traumatic brain injury can occur from blunt force trauma, uh, just, you know, bumping your head, acceleration, deceleration. So if you're in a car accident and you have like a true counter true sort of an injury, the brain can bounce back and forth between, you know, the skull and, uh, you know, and so that kind of has a, an effect on like a concussing effect on the brain as well. In the jolt? The jolt, exactly. Um, the jolt, because, you know, the, the white matter and the gray matter are different consistencies. And so when they're going against each other after a jolt, it has like a, you know, uh, the ability to cause shearing injury um, to the brain. And so mild TBIs can happen. Uh, not only you don't have to have hit your head to get a mild uh, brain injury, you could have a hypoxic injury. So if you are in an accident where you lose a lot of blood, or there's lack of oxygenation or reduction in oxygenation, uh, you know, that has the ability to cause uh, chemical changes in the brain also. You know, there's some studies that talk about chronic pain, having the ability to change chemical uh, composition of the brain or, you know, exposure to anesthesia, repeated exposure to anesthesia. So you can be in the ER because of a ton of broken bones and blood loss and, you know, uh, they're administering life-saving procedures and where you're going into surgery three, four, five, six times, that has the ability to cause uh, a brain injury as well. So I've seen the whole gamut. I've seen mild brain injuries. Um, and the way that they're generally characterized and it's such a sliding scale really is, historically, there's a Glasgow coma scale, as you well know. And, you know, if you're 13 to 15, it's mild, I mean, it's like 10, to, you know, so the numbers of the Glasgow Coma Scale dictate, you know, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe brain injury. But um, I like to use Department of Defense guides that talk about, you know, mild, moderate, and severe brain injury. And, um, you know, those are, I feel, a little bit more accurate. Uh, you can't just look at a Glasgow Coma Scale because everyone's so different. And loss of consciousness is such a, um, you know, Someone could have lost consciousness, right? But by the time the first responders get there, uh, they're perfectly conscious. And so there's no documentation of loss of consciousness when it in fact occurred. The Department of Defense guidelines talk about a confused state. I think that's more accurate. And a lot of right. doctors to agree that you could, you know, you don't have to have lost consciousness to have a traumatic brain injury. It could be uh, moments of, you know, confusion or altered consciousness or a feeling of like being offended. Um, so there's various of factors that go into uh, whether or not uh, there was a mild, moderate, or severe brain injury and how that's characterized. As far as I'm concerned, because of the Department of Defense guidelines, if I've got any radiographic evidence, uh, then immediately it's a moderate brain injury because mild traumatic brain injury, by definition, you're not going to see on an x-ray or an MRI because it's too mild to capture on, you know, on, on radiograph. Um, I don't know if I've done a good job of answering your question, but I can go on. That's, that's <laughs> great. That's great because I know that from sports, I mean, there's a lot of kids that are playing sports oh, yeah. and we've heard so much about football. I mean, brain injury in playing football, American football, not soccer. Uh, there is so much of that. I mean, a small little baseball hitting your head can also give a, a con concussion to us. Yeah. So, one of my uh, one of the questions that was asked uh, since I introduced that you were going to be on, someone messaged me and said that four years ago her husband was doing a delivery, and um, he had uh, he had an accident on the job, but because it was just a delivery, and nothing showed up until a year later when he was having all these headaches and everything is that part of head injury and i said that's a great question absolutely so a lot of the symptoms of an mtbi uh, you know can present themselves later on they don't you know come about right away um in fact you know there are some injuries that cause you know brain injuries that can result in encephalomalacia which is you know um, atrophy of the tissue and the brain and so you know, you start having like dementia-like symptoms and memory issues, but that doesn't really happen three to six months uh, until three to six months after the injury. Um, so there are symptoms that can come uh, come up later. It just kind of depends. And a lot of times, you know, something happens and you don't 
you don't think much of it. Um, if it's part of a bigger injury, in other words, if you're in an accident where you punctured a lung, where you've broken some bones, you get to the ER, the ER doctors are more concerned with dealing more with the more emergent and apparent injury. So oftentimes they're going to overlook that little bump on your head. Um, and you're not going to think anything of it until three to four months after when you're finding yourself being more irritable, you know, maybe a little dizziness, maybe headaches like this gentleman. So it absolutely can be attributed to that mechanism of injury at work. And um, if it in fact is, you should hurry up and contact your prior employer, return employer, and file a claim form and initiate, uh, initiate some treatment for that. Perfect. So when something like that happens, I think in, in, in life, anything, that's why I love journaling, document things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you well, never know. The problem is, though, you know, if you've had a brain injury, if you had a concussion and you're sort of you're like in a daze, if you will, you are not going to be the best person to document that. You're going to have some retroactive amnesia potentially. You're going to lack insight into your own deficits potentially. So a lot of times I talk to loved ones because they are the best measure uh, of, of what really happened to this person. They can tell me more articulately like how he was before or how she was before versus how she is now so that I can convey that to the doctors in the case. But you know, depending on how the severity of the accident, what the mechanism was, the injured person, unfortunately, is not always going to be aware of, of what happened to them. Well, allow me to say this, because I changed my career 21 years ago because I healed myself through hypnotherapy, and that's why I never pursued becoming an attorney. I want to know what is your why? Why did you choose this line and this specific brain injury for your career? You know, um, I am a first generation immigrant kid. I moved here at 11 years old and uh, my brother and I pretty much raised ourselves because my parents were really busy working, dad overseas, mom 80 hours a week to put food on the table. And so, you know, we really, um, we really saw our parents sacrifice and we had it tough growing up and I wanted to ensure that I can, um, that I can, you know, avail myself of a random opportunity and give my kids a better future. And so I was intent on going to graduate school. However, I started working really early on to kind of help uh, out and it's difficult to juggle both. And so I was doing uh, makeup full time. I was an undergrad. I was kind of not doing so great in school. School wasn't a priority at the time. And something clicked. I just surrounded myself with a lot of Armenian and, you know, Iranian friends, most of whom were families uh, that had been here a generation or two. And there was a huge emphasis placed on education. And so I saw them going on to graduate school and I found myself thinking, you know, if they can do it, perhaps I can do it too. Maybe I ought to push myself, you know, I don't have the same support structure, but maybe I can do this. And so, you know, I, it was either, I, med school, I was faint at the side of blood, even though I'm really fascinated by, um, you know, medicine as it pertains to, you know, the brain. And, um, you know, I sit on the, neuro, uh, the UCLA neurosurgery board and the stuff that they discuss in these board meetings goes over my head that is just so incredible. Mm. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. I get to, um, you know, I get to uh, be on the cutting edge of uh, neuroscience but I also get to advocate uh, on behalf of injured folks and, um, and get the best of both worlds. But, you know, law school isn't like med school. It's not like you go in and you specialize and get a law degree and it's kind of wherever you fall. So I started out as a defense attorney and I was in court one day and a woman was crying on the steps and she said to me that my husband fell off the roof and, um, you know, our attorneys kind of get us to settle the case for $80,000 and that's not going to be enough for his medication for a month. We don't want to do it. We don't know what to do. He's going to drop us. And so I had just gone out on my own with a partner back then and I talked to him and I convinced him as defense attorneys, we should take this one plaintiff's case because I think we can do great things with it. And sure enough, we did. We took it on. We developed it. We worked it up. We settled it for mid seven figures. And then something just clicked like that was what I was meant to do. And um, I never really marketed or advertised much after that. We just kind of got word of mouth referrals and I've been uh, specializing in brain injury litigation since. Sweet. So yeah. 
you see, there is always a story. Something impacts us to transition into something. That's why I call it the why. Why this particular one? Because this is so, it, it's not just like, okay, I'm an attorney for uh, just a worker's comp, but you specialize. So that said, what has been a breakthrough in your life? Just like that client that, because there is no accidents in life, everything, there is a good reason for everything. And uh, what has been a breakthrough in your life? And there's so many sort of sliding door moments and, and breakthrough moments. But if I had to think about it, I would say, you know, I wound up in this little submit, traumatic uh, brain injury litigation. And I get to help people out. And I feel so blessed to be able to make a you know, good living doing it. But I never really understood, like, why, you know? And then five years ago, I was in Paris for my birthday. And I got a call from my brother. My mom had collapsed in the middle of the night with a massive left MCA stroke at a seven millimeter midline shift. She wasn't responding. Um, I was on the phone for 36 hours until we were able to catch the flight back. And I reached out, I must have reached out to all of my resources and the brain injury community. We finally were able to get her to rehab over the phone and got her to the best hospital. It was the best doctor who saved her life. Um, when we were talking on the phone to the doctor, they were telling us to contact the hospice and get ready, you know, for her to, to, to pass. And so um, I was so grateful in that moment because it was so close to home for me. And to mm. be able to, and I think at that point, I understood why. Um, had I not been in this situation, I would not have been able to, you know, uh, be there for my mom. And she may or may not have been with us today. And so I'm very, very grateful to all of my friends and colleagues in the brain injury community who helped her and helped me in my time of need. And so now when I represent these families, it means something entirely different because I felt it on my own skin and I understand how life-changing that can be. My mom went from being this incredibly capable being i uh, you know i draw on the strength from her uh to being completely dependent overnight and it had a huge impact on our family and so now when i tell my clients i know what you're going through actually you know what you're going through and um and so that would have been i think a breakthrough moment for me to understand why it is it. i why it is i am uh, god chose for me to do what i do well in life Often when we do things, we don't recognize the gift in it mm -hmm. and until it's the time, uh, because sometimes things happen and it's negative and through that pain, through that negativity, through that fall, through coming to you and, you know, they suffer so much. And yet the other side, I call it when they cross the bridge of to the either healthier place or a well place. They see this transition and experience, and that's where the gift is. Um, how do you get the right people on your team? I mean, I always joke that, you know, obviously TBI medicine is very complex. It's a very medicine heavy area of practice, and it's difficult, I think, most would agree. Um, but the hardest part of my job by far is not, you know, the complex cross-examinations or the trial work. The hardest part of my job is managing people. And I've been blessed to have some really amazing people on my team who've been with me a really long time. But even so, you know, when you've got so many different personalities under one roof, uh, doing stressful work, because legal work is gratifying work, but it's also high stakes. We do only catastrophic injury cases. We have folks coming to us at the most difficult time in their lives relying on us. And so as you can imagine, uh, you know, it can be stressful, but I've been very fortunate. We've got a very tight-knit, family-like environment here. Um, and, you know, I can easily say in 16 years, maybe we've had one bad apple, but everyone else has been really amazing. And um, and they're all invested and, and really see the gift in what they do and feel great about what they do. My uh, office manager's been with me 10 years. He's got a license plate that says TBI Advocate. You know, he's really... They really, um, you know, they don't take what they do lightly. That said, we have office lunches three times a week. We abide by all the COVID rules. We're all six feet apart. We've got plastic partitions. Nonetheless, we all like being here and we all like spending time together. And I think that that's really important to have a good, 
healthy life uh, work environment where people enjoy going to work. Beautiful. Um, you have such an incredible, uh, I, I even mentioned it to you. I said, you have a great sense of humor. I love the way you come across on Fridays and the things you do. It's like, it's like a trucker. Does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your fashionista part of you. And yet when I'm sure when you are with a client, when you're in court, uh it's a what is it that they say be aware of the boss here walks the boss <laughs> and it's a different personality so how do you manage work uh being a super lawyer being an acclimate uh a leader uh, a presenter an educator a mom a wife not that many people don't i know we do it but who is the biggest supporter in your life so I have to say, I'm very lucky. I've got an amazing support structure around me, starting with my husband. He's incredible. He's like, no one else could really cut up with me. I'm being completely honest. So my husband was a really successful dentist. He had a cosmetic dental practice here in Woodland Hill. He retired a few years ago, and now he helps me run my practice. And so, you know, he's there. And I feel like I've got that extra support instead of eyes in my office, which gives me the latitude to do what it is I need to do, you know? So between him and my incredible staff, the help at home, um, I, I'm not afraid to ask for help, Lisa. I realize it takes a village sometimes, and it really does, you know? And as far as the goofy stuff, the fashion stuff, you know, I really am a huge proponent that everyone needs to have a creative outlet so you don't lose your mind. And there is some creativity to legal writing and making legal arguments in court, no doubt this is not the same. And I love fashion and it's always sort of been my thing and I've got a creative streak. And so I really enjoy making those goofy videos and playing dress up to blow off steam. Um, you know, everyone's got something and that's just sort of my thing. But um, the juggling part it is just makes life interesting, I think. You know, I love having two boys. At first, I was really concerned. I'm so grateful the silver lining in COVID has been for me to be able to be home and spend more time with them and work from home, which I love. But, you know, before I used to really worry and think, gosh, you know, am I, am I being a good enough mom? There's always parental guilt. But, you know, I come to the conclusion that I like for my boys to see me in this role and to see what a strong woman looks like. And it's important for them to understand that, you know, moms are bosses. They go out. They do great things. I take my boys to the conferences I'm speaking at. They're proud of me. Um, they observe. And, you know, I, I, I do the best I can. I try to be easy on myself and realize that, you know, juggling it, you know, something's going to give every day and it does. And that's part of the territory and that's okay. You know, do you have a daily ritual? You know, um, yes and no. I, uh, I, I would like to meditate more, but I realized that, you know, mornings can be hectic for me. I'm not a morning person. So now I, uh, I say my prayers at night with my boys before we go to sleep. And then I take a nice long bath and I kind of do my best thinking and unwinding uh, before I go to sleep. And that's sort of my way of calming down a little bit because I don't drink. Um, although I've been told I should probably have a glass of wine at night. It's just not my thing. It's not safe to ever quiet. And so, um, you know, I do positive affirmations in the mirror, just kind of depending on how my mood is. Um, to you know help boost the positive energy um i try to work out regularly because you know healthy body healthy mind for sure um but yeah that's it i try to spend as much time with my kids as i can and that is that is my happy place that's beautiful because one of the things that i share with everyone about water is a cleanser and when you do it at night and you're taking a bath and you're as as you said it's my relaxed time. That is the best time that if there is any stressors and blames and hurt and pain or anything that it's negative, you can just ask the water to take it because we're all energy and the water can just take it. And when you get up and you do the last shower, ask it to go all the way down the drain. Okay. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah, we just release it down the drain. Right. Flush it, flush it. No. Flush it down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
affirmations are wonderful. And when we repeat it, and as you do it in the mirror, it's like looking at yourself and saying, this is who I am talking to instead of just an affirmation, if it's not repeated. So you were already doing incredible self-realization. <laughs> so I don't want to ask you, how do you describe your style? Because you have such an eccentric, classic, eclectic, uh, fun style. But what is the best and the worst time in your life that you can just say, this was probably the worst and this is the best? I wouldn't characterize it as worst or best, you know, or a sign sort of. Um, that made an impact. That made an impact. Look, I mean, some of the hardest times were when I was literally a starting student. Um, I remember, really? you know, like having law school acceptance, but not being sure if I could go because I couldn't afford the books for the semester and financial aid hadn't come through. And I had to borrow a thousand dollars from my aunt to get a laptop. I mean, just crazy stuff like that. Um, you know, a uh, couple of noodles uh, and I, I forget now, Chipotle, I think was a treat. You know, I, I've had some, we've had some really difficult times as first generation immigrants here. And, um, you know, there were times that, you know, I was 10, my brother was five, we were home alone until nine o'clock, so my mom was working and, you know, social services, you know, would come to our home and, you know, just really sort of things that make an impact, mm. you know, but the best time is the time I now get to spend with my kids and the things that I now get to enjoy that I get to observe them enjoy that I didn't have growing up within reason because I'm not interested in raising brats and that's a constant daily struggle but you know the realization that I had a guardian angel and somehow things were really tough but somehow here I am now and I recognize just how blessed I am you know to do the work I do to be able to provide for my family to have everyone be healthy and alive and well, um, it's just a humbling sort of realization, you know? I believe nowadays being here, being present, being healthy and having our loved ones to with ourselves, uh, especially during COVID is one place that we can say, this is absolutely, the absolutely. My heart goes out to everyone who's affected by it, you know, and we see it every day. We had a you know, beloved doctor, a friend of ours passed, you know, just this week. It's, it's, it's really, it's really um, tragic, you know, to observe, but um, certainly we feel blessed. What, what, what is one book you can rec recommend, either one or two that you, oh. is busy. she's going to say, I don't read books. I only read transcripts. Oh my God, I'm in the process of writing the forward for a book right now um, that friends of mine wrote on Brain Injury. And so, um, look, I mean, gosh, the books that are relatable that I think anyone or everyone would enjoy. Um, I think any book from Malcolm Gladwell, he's like a modern day uh, Nietzsche or like a modern day uh, social uh, uh, philosopher to me. I think he's amazing. I think I love Blink. I love. Um, all of his books. I'm blanking on the titles of light right now, but um, I think I, I walked away from those books gaining pearls of wisdom that I got to apply to my life, whether it was Outliers or Blink or that one, the name of which I can't remember now, but I think that's really great reading for anyone, uh, irrespective of your profession, your age, or you know where you are in life. I think there are um, life lessons and applicable uh, things that you can learn and, and gain from reading it um, other than just pure, you know, entertainment and insight. Well, a pearl of wisdom, a word that you can share with our audience today would be. You should have sent me the script ahead of time. <laughs> Isn't this much better when it's yeah. unscripted? This is say. why this is why the best interviews are unscripted because 
it's about what you feel that you also speak it because if it was prepared and it was rehearsed then it is like okay it's all done but this yeah, is yeah. the real yeah. interview be so yeah. with that in mind i would say um be authentic be genuine be yourself and it's really difficult to do especially in the social media era where there is immense pressure and uh, criticism and scrutiny from others i suffer from it too in my profession i get bullied believe it or not uh you know, wow yeah i mean by you know colleagues others you know they'll say things uh about you know, my social media presence or whatnot but i think you just have to be true to yourself and you, you get slack for being that i get slack for being myself exactly and um and so all, all i would say be your best self irrespective of the noise and tune out the noise and focus on the positive energy because i started doing this thing where i would get so hurt or so upset and take something to heart and a colleague would tell me look it's just business you know you can't take it personally it's just business they give you the competitor and so it, but i would really you know feel like but you know i just need to have everyone like me and it's finally come to a certain place where I just don't care. I feel like I owe it to myself and to my family to be a true representation of myself. And if someone doesn't like it, tune that out and focus on the positive energy. The way in which I choose to focus on the positive energy is, you know, I'll, I'll surround myself with people who, who uh, constantly give it whose opinion matters. I started doing this thing where I'll look at my, you know, messages. I get messages by email or social media DMs from, Folks who don't, you know, you know, you get your DMs, you go and check on every once in a while, and they'll be like, you know, a sweet law student talking about, you know, how they're inspired by my case or not, and I'll take screenshots of those, and I'll save them, and if I'm ever feeling down or if I'm having a tough day, I'll go back to it to kind of remind mm -hmm. myself and really kind of um, immerse myself in the positivity and the positive energy and just tune out the rest of the picture, you know? So that was a lengthy pearl. It was a whole strand of pearls. <laughs> mine is stand up for yourself because you matter and if we're not standing up for ourselves no one else is going to do it for us true true words of wisdom yeah with that i want to thank you i know this was a time that you had to carve away from in the midst of your work and i truly appreciate it we got our days together we got our hours together we got our social media together you know what we are doers that's right that's right that's right and i admire your page as well and everything that you're doing and i'm taking you up on that offer to hypnotize this COVID 10 pounds off of my body <laughs> And with that, I want to say thank you so much to Tina and all of you, my viewers. If you believe that you or someone, uh, one of your loved ones is suffering with any kind of a workers' compensation or any kind of an injury to the head or uh, any part of a uh, body, physical, mental, emotional, then you contact pardon me as at any kind of catastrophic injury exactly it's a trauma and injury uh please contact tina ojavian at the uh, ojavian law group and from there she will take care of the rest and so with that i want to say thank you tina would you do me a favor sure. complete this sentence okay tina is tina is oh tina is Delighted to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all next week on Heel Talk Tuesdays. And until then, I wish you uh, a good day. May God's blessings be with you and the universal light surround you. See you next week. See Bye. you. Thanks, Lisa John. Take care. Thank you, Tina John. Bye -bye. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from the